to the stage is Nkechi Ali Balogan. Can you come to the stage, Nkechi? She is a, a PR, a PR um, expert is not the word. You can come this way. An expert is not the word. She is, um, and I hate using the word guru because it's so overused. But let's put it this way. She recently was given a Lifetime Achievement Award for services to the Nigerian PR industry. So that's worthwhile of a, another round of applause. Thank you, Nkechi. And then I'm going to bring up Charles Otudor. Charles is a global brand, um, global, global brand innovator and founder of Abstract Brand Consultings. And then I'm going to bring on someone who knows, needs no introduction, but I'll bring him up. Omojua. <laughs> and then last but not least, we're going to bring up Chamberlain, who is an anchor and producer on Channels Television. I'm sure you've know him, seen him well. None. None. So we'll just share this with you. No, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, as I mentioned, this, this um, panel is really speaking about leveraging communications to challenge the so called African shithole narrative. And I know where I was. I live in, I was born and raised in the UK, but I live in the United States. I live in New York City, and I know where I was and what I felt when I was watching CNN and I heard the comments that the president said, which he has since uh, refuted, and he said that he did not say shit hole, he said that he said shit house. What's the difference? There is no difference. So that just tells you he's admitting the first part of that word. So, Nkechi, you reside here in Lagos. Where were you and what did you think when you, hit, when you heard those words from the President of the United States of America describing countries in Africa and in other parts of the world in that way? Do I have a mic? Good afternoon, everyone. Claudine, thank you for inviting me to this program. I quite honestly, and I want you to believe me, I never really gave it a thought. I never took the President of the United States very seriously. I wasn't bothered about that statement. And the reason is that, in as much as I respect uh, the President of the United States, I thought he was talking from a standpoint of ignorance. Because, as you all know, there is no American without the African blood. The African blood is what brought about America. And so any time an America insults Africa is actually also insulting, uh, insults Africa is actually insulting America. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we do not need a Trump to validate us. We are Africans, we are Nigerians. And today it is on record that Nigerians are the most educated people in America and they are also outperforming their American counterparts. And if they are doing so, which means we are also contributing to the economy of America. Thirdly, according to, let's go by the Oxford Dictionary of uh, shithole. Shithole means dirty, shabby, otherwise unpleasant place. It also defines it as a really bad place or building, especially somewhere undesirable to live in. Now, if we go by this definition, it means that <laughs> if you call Africa a shithole, then we have pretty good company in America because we have some places that can be described as shithole in America. I mean, let's talk about the rodent uh, uh, filled uh, subways in New York. Let's talk about the smog in Houston. Let's talk about Florida, which researchers have actually come out to say they are the worst polluted, they have the worst polluted soil, even in Houston. So, every country have their own shit holes. But then, I think 
even if I didn't take him seriously, something came to my mind that it was very instructive. Maybe it was time for us. It was a wake-up call. A wake-up call for us to start redefining who we are. A wake-up call for us to start deprogramming us. Because I see a lot of millionaires in this room. I, I know that you all identify with being an American. You dress like an American. You want to speak like an American. You want your hair to be like an American. Until we are able to come back to realize and define who we are, we will never go beyond that. I'll give you one quote. Listen to this quote. I had to type it out because I couldn't memorize it. It says, this is a Lord Macaulay's address to the British Parliament on 2nd February 1835. It says, I have traveled across the length and breadth of Africa, and I have not seen one person who is a beggar. I have not seen one person who is a thief. Such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber, that I do not think we would ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. And therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture. For if the Africans think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, they will lose their native culture, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation and I was yeah and I'll say that since 1835 we have been a truly dominated nation but Chino Achebe signs a lot of warning says until the lions write his own history the story of the hunt will always favor the hunter and listen to Ibn Khaldun he says the vanquished are always fond of imitating the conqueror's motives attire creed and other positions and custom now, on this background, I think it is time for us to start deprogramming Africans, redefining who we are, and creating a new identity for us. I think I'll stop here for now to give others. So, thank you for that, Nkechi. And where was that quote from? What did you say that quote was from? Where? The, qu the first quote that you read... Lord Macaulay, I uh, was one of the British, uh, what do they call them then? A uh, member of parliament, British member. Okay, thank you, Nkechi. Before I go any further, um, just, I was just reminded of the hashtag for this event. Please, the hashtag is hashtag SMW Lagos and or hashtag SMW PR Africa. That's the hashtag for this session. Omojiwa. What do you think about these, these comments from the United States president? Do you, do, you, do you think we have, we as in Africans, have any responsibility for him feeling he can make a comment like that or not? Um, first of all, the truth is I didn't think about it. Okay. When it happened, I didn't regard it. Can you share it? The reason is because President Trump is not, no, no, no. President Trump is not the problem, okay. he's a victim. He's a victim. He's a victim. He's a consequence of the problem. For anyone who has ever lived in Western Europe, especially because America even has some, it's much better. If you, for those that, for who that have lived in Western Europe, even, even um, Eastern Europe, when you see Africa reported in, in any newspaper, it is likely to be something negative. More often, in fact, you're hardly going to see any news story related to an African country or the continent itself that is positive. And the same thing with the U.S., right? There is a very, very intentional way of reporting Africa that seeks to retain this paternal relationship between Africa and the West. It's, it's a pun of pornograph a pornography of disease, disaster and everything that, that could be wrong. 
Now, let's not fool ourselves. Do we have these problems? Of course we do. Of course we do. But the truth of the matter is, just pay attention to, and I have respect for these people that I'm about to mention. I have respect for people that do their jobs. But just pay attention to the average foreign journalist, one. Pay attention to the average foreign platform, two. First of all, to the journalist. Anytime there's an extraordinary story that is resounding and powerful, if they cover it at all, boom, it's done and they move on. When it's a really, really bad news, it, it, they, they go paranoid. These are things we know. They are doing their job, but the truth of the matter is there is an intentional obsession with what is wrong with us. A pornography of disaster, disease, corruption, all of those things that are really true, but it's not balanced. Then with respect to the platforms, it is so bad that they don't have any positive content on Africa, they have to create special Africa-focused content. I don't need to mention the names. Special programs that are focused on th good things that are happening in Africa. That's why when some people say, oh, they mentioned me on CNN, I'm like, which, which of the CNN? Is it focused Africa CNN or normal CNN. And then the, the, the saddest part of that is not even that they have that particular program, a token, a, a token by itself. It is that those programs are not being broadcast to the rest of the world, though. They are being broadcast back to us. It's like we're t you're speaking to the, preaching to the choir. They are preaching back to us. So when it is negative, it's to the rest of the world. When it is positive, first of all, they craft a special program for Africa because, of course, these people naturally don't really do big things, so let's select a platform. So President Trump is a consequence. It's an effect. It's not the cause. So when it happened, I, wasn't, I didn't feel so bad. And then on the other side, we Africans have to be conscious of our powers now. If you remember what happened with respect to Kenya, someone tells CNN, Kenya was, um, CNN was, the Pope was visiting CNN, and CNN, um, the vote was visiting Kenya, and CNN was saying something it was like... The, I think it was the um, Barack Obama was visiting. Was it, was it Barack hot, Obama? The hot, yeah, the no, hotbed I think it was even before Barack Obama. Oh, and they were saying hotbed of terrorism. Right. But it's not just, it's not just the West. I've, I've met fellow Nigerians. When I say I'm going to Rwanda, I'm like, ah-ah. Uh -uh. Rwanda, what are I going to do in Rwanda? It's not their fault. The first, time I went to, the first time I went to Dakar, I was screaming from before the plane landed because it was, so, it was a huge contrast from what Dakar was supposed to be. See, the most powerful force in the world is the media. That's the most powerful force in the world. Any media platform that you watch, whether you like it or not, whether you're educated or not, they are shaping you. I was, I was taken by the beauty of Dakar mostly because... Mm. Dakar was not supposed to be like that in my own head. Mm -hmm. And that's just and an why example. Was that? Because the, the Dakar that I know is, is from the West. It's from CNNs and the BBCs. It's hardly from, I mean, I don't watch any, or CFI for those that are French, um, French speaking. So what do we do? First of all, we need to recognize that this thing exists. Secondly, we need to accept the fact that some of the realities that they, they portray are true. But let's not get into that pornography of disaster and disease and all that is wrong with us because we also have gotten into that where we are actually more obsessed about the things we get wrong than we are interested in amplifying the things we get right. Take for instance, look at the beauty of these chairs. It's so beautiful. And I think this should be a story. These chairs should be a story. Social media week should be a story. And these are, they, they, may, look, they may look like they are small, but have you not seen where seemingly small issues are amplified abroad? So we need to counter that narrative. Not to now do exactly what they did, which is to obsess. So they are, they are obsessed about what is wrong. It's not for us to now be obsessed about what is right. It's to have a balance. To let people know that we are actually normal people. Where we have the Koyi, we, I don't want to mention the name of a place. We have slums. Where we have the high, high rises, we have huts. Where we have the corrupt people, we have good people. Where we have people that are stealing billions, we have really, really poor people that are seeing $10,000 in taxes and returning them. But I have to say again, President Trump is not the problem. He's just a victim himself. Okay, thank you for that, Moju. Chamberlain, as we're talking about TV networks, let's talk about uh, you and your thoughts working with a network like Channels, um, with international networks having the narrative that they do about the continent. 
um, and about Africa and Africans. Where does, um, where does yourself and a channel like Channels Television sit in the responsibility to counteract some of the negative um, and unbalanced portrayals of Africans in Western media? Well, um, um, at some point, I almost felt he was making us a <laughs> victim <laughs> of what happens. In what way? Because you know, when he talks about the media, the narrative that is out there. But yes, um, there's a truism in that. Because the way it is, is such that um, there was mixed feelings for me when I heard it. But mixed feelings, the, as in, why did you have mixed feelings? Well, it was both, okay, what could have informed that comment, and how should we approach it? But I wasn't particularly bothered personally. I was very concerned about the other people who did not understand the, um, what word do I use now? The, the way the media works. Now, our role as media is very huge in terms of how the people internalize whatever messages we put out there for them. You know, we get to see on a regular basis when we put our content and the next thing you hear, somebody tells you, oh, can't you see the way CNN did something? And then, you know, you, you sit back and you only just say, well, if only they know what they are actually saying. Because I, I see this from different perspectives because of our background. One is that the consequence of what they say is that whatever they tend to see in foreign media, they take it as gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, such that even the experts who are here, and that's why, with due respect to most of our uh, professionals in this country, it turns out that we don't give them the due that they actually deserve. You see it at almost every level, at the federal level, the states. Meanwhile, these same professionals, when we travel abroad, these are the people who are making things happen. But if I bring it back to the role that the media has to play in Nigeria here, it's such that um, producers, uh, content, message design experts, and again, do you know when I say that, I always like to look at the background to be a message design expert or a content person, you have to have some sort of, um, there's some basics that you require. Of, but before we came on, we were talking about some of the theories of mass communication, how we didn't seem to take it very seriously when we were in school. But when you then get to the media, you then understand, oh, so this is what this theory means. This is what it explains. So when you are designing a message and a particular content to a particular audience, you are deliberate. And you do not necessarily have to just be uh, short term about it because we see a lot of short term plans and programs here. And in the long run, it doesn't achieve any aim. So we in the media, the reason why I was worried about that is because we have a very huge role. And um, to a large extent, We haven't actually lived up to what we should be doing. Which is? Which is number one. It goes beyond us just portraying the bad things. Look, that's the nature of news, by the way, uh -huh. when <laughs> bad news is news. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. and well, it's sensational well, or sensationalism. We no, we, we don't get sensational in our no, medium. Well, see, bad news is news, right? But yeah. most Mike. of our perception, I accept that bad news is the business, but most of our perception of the West is the beauty. Until I got to New York, I didn't know that I could, I could get killed just by walking. There are places in New York you dare not go at 7 p.m. In, in Chicago and other places. But those, those things are underreported compared to yeah. the positive. So there can be a balance, right? My point is that bad news is news. But bad news is not all the news that there is. You know, it's such that the media also has to be deliberate 
in terms of the messages we create out there. Yes, we see those things happen in those countries too, but they are thematic about the messages they want. Let me even give you an example. In, in Houston, last year, there was a very young lad. He was the son of a very wealthy man. He committed an offense. He got to the, uh, to the police station. They looked at it. When I saw it on the CNN US there, guess the kind of name they gave it. They didn't call it the regular crime. They said that, oh, he was suffering from affluenza. Mm. Yeah. So, well, there's, there's, a, there's a thing that they, a phrase that somebody recently came up with in America, and that is uh, white privilege is one that we've all heard of, but there's also one called white exemption. And that's a new one that people will start hearing more and more. White exemption means they're exempt from certain things that we're not exempt of. So you can have several young, lone, white males, time after time after time, go and shoot people at concerts, in schools, at movie theaters, and yet still nobody is talking about doing a study on why so many white males commit these crimes of mass shootings. You don't get black males doing that. If it was black males doing that, they probably would, would run all black males out of America. And that's what they call white exemption, as well as white privilege. Um, and I, but I want to just move on and talk to, um, just to talk to Charles about branding. Do you, I mean, I know, I know people talk about um, Africa or African nations have a branding problem. But do you think it's a branding problem that would cause uh, the president to say something like this? Yes. Sorry that the mic's not working, guys. Um, thank you. Um, uh, let's yes. go back a bit. Um, look at our brand, the brand called Africa. Viacom it's so easy. Media to... Networks Africa here in Nigeria. It's so easy um, to please the Basically, brain. for future generations, where is, where is that voice? how is Viacom playing? Can the, the, can the sound people? Uh, Handle that, please, because we're getting disruption from the other stage. Okay, um, let's take our brand from the from historical we perspective. Celebrated. How many African brands are truly branded as countries? We are not proactive; we are reactive as a people. Most successful brands are painstakingly put together. It takes time, effort, patience, and consistency. Every time there's a negativism out there. How prepared are our media partners from Africa to propagate the positivism or control the news that goes out? How much content from Nigeria on your voice of Nigeria goes out that is known, that is circulated abroad? How often does voice of Nigeria articulate a strategy every year, not ad hoc, not reactive, but proactive? As long as you allow your narrative to remain in the hands of others. They will tell the story the way they want to tell the story. Branding is all about being deliberate. You want to be successful with your brand, you need to sit, plan, articulate, and execute based on a well thought out strategy. There is no strategy in place for the brand called Nigeria in terms of communication right now. We are just a radarless brand, left, right, we hit the rocks, we rebound, how many times have you heard these different stories from the same government? How many girls were abducted? How many were not abducted? I mean, that is not consistency in articulating your position. And this is not just about Nigeria. This is across the whole continent, Africa. Now, does that give Trump the right to say this? I'll pause. You have to look at your brand from the mirror point of view. How you, are, you carry yourself is the way you're going to be addressed. Now, he's, I, want to, I want to refer to what Amadjo has said, that he's just a victim. Trump is also is a victim. But first of all, who gave him the opportunity to talk about our country and our countries that way? We did. We're not articulated. Our strategy is we, not... How did we do that? Because... We have no strategy in place for communicating who we are. We have no strategy globally. Now, let's go back to the 70s. 
the perception of an American was based on the movies, right? The trash buckling cowboy with the cigarettes. We have platforms. How much of our content, apart from the new content coming out of Africa, is positive, shows the positivism of Africa? We know we have the negatives. They also have the negatives, but we do not push the positive. It must be deliberate. Now, does that give me rights? That is neither here nor there, because it, you can argue this to and fro. You might not have a, a, a solid platform to have a, a, a concrete a, agreement, but he said it and he said it. But why do we think he had the guts to say it? Okay, okay, okay I'm not sure what you want. Can I, 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 okay. I, I have a missed feeling, right? For a brand to stand as a brand, it has to be original. The big question I want to ask us today, who are we as a nation? Do we have an identity? For as long as we have been programmed, the first thing the white man did in Africa is first of all to program us in believing that we do not have self-esteem, we do not have a culture, we do not have a language, right? But then let us take the American history. After the slave trade, they refused to be like the British. And so they came up with their own American language. They refused to drink tea. They went for coffee. They called their lifts, they call it elevator. They call their own soccer, they have their American football. So they, what am I saying in effect? They created an identity for themselves which they portray till tomorrow. The Indians are the same. But the Africans, we are ashamed of who we are. We keep looking for the white man to validate us. We wear their clothes, we wear their fashion, we don't have anything we identify with, yet we have our own culture. But because we have been programmed, you see, when you walk, when you win somebody's psyche, it's always difficult. You have taken over his mind. If I ask the young people today, how best do you want to go to a premiere? They are looking for, last time, sorry, this is not uh, meaning to insult anybody. We had a premiere the other time. We were asked to dress like the Arabs. Hello? Okay. Thank God I know the Dubai people sponsored it. But must we dress like the Arabs? And then you find us. Well, there's well, nothing wrong with dressing no, like us. No, there's Arabs. nothing wrong with if, that. But then, if, if, if they would dress like us. If they would dress like us. Nothing wrong with that. But nobody dresses like us. We keep copying. So, what am I saying, in fact? I think it is time for us to rewrite our own story. And content must be deliberate. It must be appropriate. And it must be pushed out. I think it's time that the media should also sit up, create some story bank. A story bank in the sense that when something happens to support an initiative from Africa, to support a branding initiative, for instance, we go to that bank and bring out a story that pushes out that uh, initiative. And then we must be consistent. We must be consistent. When we have in a group, for instance, all we believe in is to look like the American. We do their hair. You see some young girls, they carry hair from here to here, and then they don't have any sense of identity. And so we have given the world the opportunity to address us the way they want because we ourselves don't know who we are. So I think it's time for us to start rewriting our stories. Thank you. And Katie starting a revolution up in uh, Social Media Week. I think one thing I would like to say is that, yes, and a module, what do you, I want you to speak to this afterwards, but yes, there's one thing to speak to of um, the self esteem of us as African and black people, but then also. How about, and we were talking about this earlier in Keiichi, how about the entrenched perception that um, Europeans, uh, Caucasians, white people will have of black people and as African people? They will see you and they will, even though they will see you as a 
you have a, someone in front of you who is obviously an educated and civilized person because they think you're black, because they see you as black, because they see you as African, they are wired in their mind, not all, but a significant number, are wired in their mind to look at us through a certain prism. So whilst there's, there's a, a, my, a mind issue with us, some of us, there's also a mind issue with lots of them. And that's something that when you are interacting with people who are from the West and who are um, Caucasian and other races, they have that pre, pre-conditioned perception of who we are. And that has something to do with this as well. I think on the other side is the side of economic prosperity, right? Because we, we have slavery then we had colonialism. But even though those things have ended, the structures remain. And let's not, let's not get it twisted. The reporting style of these big international media platforms, they are not isolated from another reality. And what's that reality? It is to continue this entrenched perception, entrenched reality of the, person, uh, the personal relationship between Africa and the West where we were supposed to not know what to do. So they have to tell us what to do. In fact, when they even send us money, they don't even trust us to use it well. So sometimes they even convert the money already into food because they, they believe these ones can't manage themselves. This, this thing sounds simple, but that's exactly what happens. So it is good business for those that want the paternal reality the personal relationship between Africa and the West to remain, to continue to portray, to continue to stereotype, to continue to report and put Africa in this sense. But this can only continue also because we have economic issues. We don't need to emphasize those realities. If Nigeria, for instance, became prosperous and, Nigeria, and Af- other Africans were coming to Nigeria to thrive, it would begin to change the story. But let's not get it twisted. 400 years of slavery, about a century of colonialism, some just half a century of nationhood that has mostly been about nations storming rather than forming, there would be effects. Because the truth of the matter is, as a collective, Africa has not even formed. And that's understandable. 55 years, 50 years in the life of an individual is a big deal. But For those that have read history of the world, you would know that 50 years is very, very small. So we are just starting out. But in just starting out as individual nations, even some of of these other countries are not, South Africa is less than 30 since since 94, right? But in starting out, we have to be intentional about the problems. We have to understand the problems and know why certain things are the way they are. So why is Africa being reported this way? When we know the why, then we can say, okay, if we are not poor, if we are rich, we're not going to need this aid. We don't even need it anyway, because what's aid? What's aid? This is Africa. That other side is the West. I want to produce shoes, because people do not have shoes as an African. And when I produce these shoes, I'm going to employ people. I'm going to create, I'm going to create wealth for myself and for the people I employ. Some other people that are going to pack the shoes into boxes, they are going to, those things are going to create jobs. Then somebody comes from the West, brings free shoes. And of course, people would normally take free shoes over paying even a hundred naira for a shoe because they get to save money, right? That looks like a good thing. But that's a very bad thing. Why? Because when they bring those shoes and people wear their free shoes, the people that were supposed to be in jobs from the shoes that we would have sold are going to be out of jobs. The people that would have made those boxes are going to be out of jobs. The people that would have designed the logos and the brand perception of that thing are going to be out of jobs. Now, think of every situation that foreign aid has intervened in Africa. Those are places where we would have created jobs by ourselves. Toothbrushes. I understand extreme situations of war where people need food immediately. I would understand aid in that situation, but the truth of the matter is aid has actually kept us in a place where we're looking at these guys like this. It's entrenching it. And you see Africans haven't spent years in universities, home and abroad, and become really massive and big, and still continue to push for this agenda. Come on, let's think about it. You would never be equal to me if you continue to depend on me. It's impossible. 
Even if I told you, take this 500 naira, you're, you're independent now. As long as you continue to depend on me one way or the other, you will always be beneath me. So the first thing is to say, I, I cannot use, just, just keep your money. We will thrive. And we don't have the incentive to, because any small thing at the United States has uh, yeah, marked $800 million for Nigeria to fight whatever, whatever. And sometimes when I see the money, I'm like, ah, is it not this money that somebody, that they collected from somebody? How much is Gambia's budget? Why can't Nigeria be the one intervening in Gambia? But Nigeria will not intervene because Nigeria has not even thrived. But some of these so-called aid, they are small, but the thing is, even if it's 500 naira, as long as you are collecting it for me regularly, I'm ahead of you. And these guys understand it. Yeah. I want to say something. Yeah. Um, we have a problem at the leadership point of view. Let's not lose the track of our, our argument here. Yes, we have a big problem at the leadership point of view. Now, it's a leadership problem. And it starts with the individual. We have been... <laughs> we are independent, but we are mentally still slaves as Africans. And our biggest challenge is the mental slavery, the concept of the, the self being, um, being subdued every time we see the foreign brand. You cannot isolate the mental from the physical. So no matter how wealthy we are, we have oil wells, but our people are still running around hungry. Because mentally we are still poor as a people, Mentally, we are still poor as a leadership. Mentally, as countries, we are still poor, in spite of all our wealth. So, what type of brand are we? Can you ask a question? What type of brand are we? Are we a progressive brand? Are we a stagnant brand? Or are we just passive? I dare say, Africa is a passive brand. And that is the, the, the base of our problem. As long as Africa as a continent and its people remain mentally in slavery and re refuse to fight, Oh, there's something good coming out of Nigeria suddenly. The narrative is changing, I dare say. The narrative about Nigerian leadership has changed. Some years ago, PMB came into, this, into the limelight with all the swashbuckling and everything. For, uh, the old paraphernalia of office was almost for the picking. He's lost it. How? The same scenario that took out GEJ is throwing him out also right now. This, the narrative has changed. And it's all about the power of the mind and the media. Right. The power of the mind and the media. And then Katie, can you speak, can you speak to the mind? Because I want to yeah, get to and, Chamberlain and, and the media. And unfortunately, Thank you, even though things are changing, the West refuses, completely refuses to seize because right from the, from, right from the beginning, it is their aim to break the backbone of the African nation. And so when you see them reporting those negatives, it is still part of the plan. It is still part of that program. Unfortunately, uh, they said that our GDP, the whole of our economy, African economy, is just 2.5% of the global GDP. Can that be right? Has anybody queried it? Who came up with that? I mean, is it empirical? Nobody has questioned it. None of our media has, you know, the problem, we don't do enough research. And so because we don't do enough research, we don't even question what is on ground. And so we just take it hook, line, and sinker. You mean all the businesses we do in Africa, in this whole continent, South Africa, Nigeria, is just 2.5% of the global GDP. How did they arrive at that? But nobody has queried it. What about all the people, all, our, all Africans that are working in America, in NASA, in uh, the medical uh, field in America, nobody is writing about them. I, w I went, uh, we had a program in an Oriental Hotel about three weeks ago. And then I came out to have my coffee. I put my bag on a, bag, uh, on a chair and I went to get my coffee. By the time I came back, two whites, a lady, one white lady was sitting and there was nobody on the other side, so I put my chair there. But before I came, another white lady just came. They put my bag on the ground mm. and then she sat down and said, oh, you met the wrong black woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, excuse me, what happened? She said, I don't know. I said, I said then get up because my seat was here. I said, this is not South Africa. This is Nigeria. You don't do that here. If you do it here, we throw you out. She went all red. So 
for as long as we are not able to stand up to them. I see us at the airports. Once you are standing with a white man, you think, oh, you are right there. No, we have to change, even to develop those contents. We must change our mindsets. Let me allow that to stop. Shame me. Yes. Well, you know, the truth is, the human nature too, and I stand corrected, is such that people always want to dominate the other. So some of these things won't just drop on our laps as much as we honestly want them to change. And I can't begin to go through the challenges of the media in terms of the right, uh, not right, in terms of uh, <laughs> what the media needs to do internally to ensure that they also play that role. But I also almost always like to look inwards. And by that, I mean to us. A lot of what ever happens rises and falls with us. A lot of what happens, we allow. You know, if... I'm trying to see how I can put it in a proper context. Number one is that the tirade, you, you let... You have to determine how you're perceived or how certain things describe you. And that's why I said I wasn't personally bothered about that because it doesn't in any way, it doesn't come close to defining who I am, or what I stand for. And so I didn't have any problems with it personally. But looking at the big picture, that was why I said, why I thought, okay, we have some work to do here. And if I could pick on uh, some of the points that you've made about leadership, it's huge. The mindset of our young people because they're the future, so I always have to go there. It's very huge and very important in this. You don't have to see whoever is in any office whatsoever as though they are your Lord and you are the servants. So we in the media need to do a lot in that. And when that comment came, I thought a lot of things flashed in my mind. If we hold them accountable enough, at least do a lot more, maybe a little more than we're doing, Perhaps the images of those Africans who were crossing from one place to the other, which the media was media would always lap on that. That's, give, that's a given. And yes, we know um, conflicts it generates a lot of traffic. People always want to see who's fighting with what, who is cutting down the other. But the comments shouldn't have any bearing on us. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look inwards and ask ourselves, what kind of challenges do we have? What do we do to correct those? We need to draw attention to what is going on wrong with a view to correcting them. Because if you go through Nigeria alone, in spite of all that's happening, you still have very lovely, fantastic young people out there who have great minds, lovely ideas, they can do things. But then so at the end of the day, we just need to look at words and look at, deliberately look at those, because look, it's not all media owners or media houses that will allow you to be deliberate about bringing in the good messages. Don't forget, the media is not a charity organization. The media is out there to make money. So if it's a conflict or the bad news that is giving them all the traffic that they want and making all the money, they will do it. Make so, no mistakes So what about happens that. to social responsibility? Social responsibility in terms of, of the media. Well, social responsibility is hydro-headed in that context. Social responsibility in the conflict will have to be a little more discerning, but that doesn't mean we will blank out all of those. We will just regulate it as gatekeepers. But again, remember, behind the scenes, we we're talking about the advent of social media. How social media democratizes the space. So, um, it's a different topic entirely, but bottom line is, we need to look at ourselves and highlight the good things and show the world the good things. But even Thank if you. the media is a business, right? Even if the media is a business. So a lot of Nigerian platforms, and I have respect for all of them, they're doing great stuff. A lot of them start to show content abroad. And that's supposed to be them going global. But they are like the average Nigerian church that establishes branches abroad. It's the same. They are targeted to Nigerians. So those contents, they are on the general cable, but they are, the content is intentionally targeted to Nigerians. 
So you are still not you playing. Earlier You're not about playing the game. To the, to I know people. it involves a lot of money and everything, but you have to at least first of all see where you're going to even begin to go there and have a plan to get there. And that's big business, right? It's an opportunity that we have to start looking at that. When we're thinking of going global and going international, let's stop always stop let's stop acting like Nigerians that travel abroad and start looking for Nigerian food. Let's understand that there are opportunities and other, in other people's culture to discover. So if I'm broadcasting abroad, I should be very intentional about making sure that other people that are not Nigerian are also interested in that content. Because of course, Nigerians will be interested because this is a Nigerian content anyway. This is a Nigerian platform. We need to think about that. Because that's also a big opportunity beyond even social responsibility. Thank you, in essence, in So essence, I'd like to take this opportunity to to hang on a second, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, open up to you guys. If you have any questions, this gentleman here. Do you have a microphone, please, for the audience members? This gentleman in the second row in the very smart jacket. <laughs> Can you stand up, please, when you are? Uh, and a mic is coming to you. We, uh, we only have 10 minutes, so please be uh, very quick with your questions. Thank you very much. It's been a most informative uh, panel session. And all the panelists have been consistent in calling out the selective reporting of the Western media and how they stereotype Africa mm -hmm. and promote the stereotype of Africa being a place of disaster, what Chimamanda calls a single story. Uh -huh. My question is this, what approach should we take in challenging this stereotype? I think of two. One is to suppress the Western media, the information from the Western media, like China or North Korea has done. So where uh, we, we prevent certain uh, CNN or, so, or some other information from coming to the country. And another is to invest in our own media houses as a government. I understand that the Ministry of Information is one of the hi most highly funded in, in the country. To promote Nigerian news and have us tell our own narrative, tell our own stories, the way we want to. Which of these two methods would work better? How do you uh, suggest that we challenge this narrative? And Keiichi, can you answer that briefly? Thank you. If you can give a quick response to that. You mentioned uh, about two or three approaches. Seriously, there's nothing wrong with any of those approaches. But then, whichever approach you want to uh, use whatever strategy you want to use, it must be deliberate and you must have an objective. There is no need pushing out content and you don't have any reason why you are pushing out that content. If you look at the Indian film, for instance, right from time, they have maintained their culture, right? Look at the way Nollywood is evolving. We started quarreling that there was so much blood, so much that, but that's who we are. How many of us have watched Old Men 1, 2, and 3? How many of us have watched Dracula? How many of us have watched Vampire? How many of us have, have watched Harry Potter, Voodoo? These are all the same films. We are Africans, and that is who we are. The Indians, they've gone. You know, if you still look at Indian films, they still have the same content. But the Nigerian film today, we are carrying guns, we are shooting. Just because we want to now be like the American. Yes. We are shooting because we don't like our content. We now want to look like Americans. We now want to look like Indians. So who are we? So whatever approach you want to use, we're not saying you should lie. But for goodness sake, let us, say, let us be truthful to ourselves. Let us portray who we are. You, don't, you cannot give what you don't have. And that is why right now it's like we don't have an identity. OK, so we have another question. The ch chap in the white top, and then Charles has a comment. Okay, just before he makes his comment, okay. I think that it's critical that we define who we are as a brand. You can't chart a course without a direction. So as a nation, who are we? Have we ever sat down, all of you in this hall, have you ever sat down to ask yourselves who you are? Today I give an assignment when you go home. Ask yourself, who are you? Why are you here? What, have you defined your brand DNA before, deliberately? Not what people tell you are. For a change, go home today and ask yourself these three questions. Who are you? Why are you on this earth? And then define your SWOT analysis. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. Do it deliberately for a change. And then you see the answers you get 
if they will not challenge your thinking for a change. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abu Jerome. Um, the question is directed to Chamberlain, but before that, I really want to point out something. From what Nkechi said, she, from the parliamentarian um, speech given to those in the parliament, we were meant to find out that they've toyed with our history, they've toyed with our culture. Now, the saying goes that if you don't know where you're coming from, you cannot know where you're going to. You might want to defend my question now by trying to say, okay, you're trying to not cause hate speech or whatsoever, people not to hate another group. I wasn't born during the Civil War, but I read in Achebo, there was a country. I understood everything that happened then. Does that make me hate a particular tribe? No. It gave me an understanding of where we came from when I wasn't born. How many documentaries are you guys having in the media houses that actually depict the history of Nigeria, telling us of King Jaja of Opobu, telling us of how Queen Amina went from one third up? Just tell us what happened the history of us. An average American child knows the history of America. From primary school to the university, I, I, I have passed through other states and I've never seen any aspect of any subject or whatsoever that actually depicts the history. It's only the movie houses, um, movie producers actually come out with movies to show some of those things. Well, and most of these movies are in cinemas. How many cities have cinemas? How many people watch movies? But CN, um, channels, TVC News and the rest, especially yeah. around the whole country. So why are you guys not giving us the history of okay, Nigeria? Okay, so thank you for that question. Chamberlain. Well, number one, I wasn't born during the Civil War, so that makes two of us. <laughs> and secondly, you're right, we don't do hate speeches, so we'll always encourage that unity amongst everyone, so you're right on that one. But in terms of doing documentaries, but I think if I understand your question right, what exactly are we doing to put out those information out there? There are several ways to do it. It doesn't have to be a documentary. So if you watch the special programs you have every year now for ever since the inception of channel, 21 years now, we have over three, four, five, six hours of our history. Where are we coming from? What should we be doing? What haven't we done right? Why should we do them? The daily shows that go on every day, those are different ways that we put out those kind of messages telling us who we are and what we should be doing. But let's not get this twisted as well. The media is not to play. The media's role is complementary. We won't go out there and do certain things that the authorities or those who have been elected to perform should do. Yes, we ought to have history taught in our schools. Yes, we ought to have some of these things take responsibility and ensure those messages out there. But we can never do enough. There's always room for improvement, for us to tell the country what history we are, where we are, where we're going. But again, your point is noted, and we've been doing Thank as you. much as we can. I mean, I mean, I think, because let's be careful, we, we all have responsibilities, especially in the, in, in this, in, with respect to re the reality of social media. Um, people that have content on YouTube, I was discovered for a massive international conference just via YouTube. They didn't have to talk to anyone. So they could have easily seen some other positives about the continent. Um, when, when you post your tweets, what, what's your agenda for yourself, for your country, for your continent? Because these are open platforms and they are global. Um, I am, somebody was talking about um, suppressing. I, I'm personally not for anything that has to do with shutting down one thing because you want to build another. I feel like the best way to stop a malware from thriving is to have a thriving um, a BRT that evolves to a light rail. The, the way Lagos removed a particular form of transportation, um, I don't know how to call it, a, 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 a kind of bus system that was very, very, very dirty and very, very bad without saying we've banned it. I think we can do things like that, but a lot of it also depends on all of us as individuals because this is the first time really ever that one African, one, one individual could really influence the way a country is perceived. And that involves not just your content online, also the way you carry yourself when you go to these international platforms and exactly. places. I'm going to take two more questions, this young lady here and this lady over here. So just young lady here. Um, one thing that I really... Can you make your question, sorry, be, uh, be, be, okay. be precise and quick with your question, Yes, um, so I, I heard what everybody said, especially um, uh, ma'am, you over here and sir, um, talking about uh, branding Nigeria as a country. 
Um, I'm a returnee from the U.S., and that was an issue in terms of what, how do we brand our country to make it better. So now that we know what's on ground, the world as it is, a sitting president called um, the countries in a massive continent a shithole. So how do we then, from where we are, I'm a, I'm a blogger, you know, so from where I am, where I sit, in my little world and my little following, how do I change the narrative? And I'm sure all of us here have our own ways of disseminating content so that we can make, we can shift the paradigm. You know, that's what this gathering is about. So like, how do we shift the paradigm here based on your years of experience and expertise? Okay, uh, Chamberlain, I'm a, that's, a, I'm a that's a great so question. How do we do that? That's a great question. It's actually how I was gonna end the session, but it's okay. So can each of the panelists very, very quickly in one sentence, in one sentence, please, I beg of you to respond to her and say one thing that everybody in this audience can do to catch excellent question, thank you. Just one okay. sentence. Okay. First step is to change the way you narrate the story. Be positive. Let's stop complaining, stop complaining, but do stuff to change the system. It starts with me. It starts with you. So be the change that you want to see and then stop complaining and also try and change your narrative from your point of view. It will influence somebody else. Thank you. I think some of us have already started changing the narrative. But I would say, let us be sensitive of the environment. When you want to speak, when you want to act, look around you, where am I? And so you don't, you don't talk anyhow. Always put your best foot forward and move away from Nigerian or African pessimism and say about very positive things about Africa. Even from the way you look, I mean, look at your hairdo. That's African. Be proud of who you are. Look at the other lady. You see her, you know she's a Muslim. I mean, she's tired. I mean, that is who she is. Be proud of who you are. You don't need any white man to validate you. In fact, if you ask me, we have a better culture than the white man, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> okay, I'm not for me, it's, it's really simple to understand that um, Africa will never be defined outside of the reality of Africans, and we are Africans, all of us. So as an individual, I'll take responsibility, and then let's hope that the coming together of our perception becomes really positive. Mm -hmm. I think that, did you say you're a blogger? Okay, so in all the messages you post out, you post every day, if you can actually, I think same goes to everybody, including us, there is always one thing, one thing good, that one Nigerian has done out there they do it every day. So if in all the 10 messages you post, if you choose one and publish that, and people see it, if you are consistent in that every day, you never can tell that alone because it's seen globally. So that will go. You need to, we need to encourage ourselves. Say one good thing that somebody has done. It's never, ever all doom and gloom. There's always something good in everybody. Okay, and, I, and I'm, gonna answer, I'm gonna answer that question because this is something that I personally do. So I travel across the continent, um, been to many African countries. My favorite is obviously, obviously Nigeria, and I've, been here, and I've been here the most. But even on my personal, you can clap to that, right? I'm saying it's my favorite. So even on my, on my personal um, social media and in the articles that I write, I will never, I am very unbalanced in how I talk about um, Africa and Africans. I'm unbalanced because everything I say is positive. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's enough, there's enough media outlets and enough people out there showing negative things. So you're not going to hear that from me. So when, for example, um, there was a very hideous news story out of Libya, when there were slaves being sold in Libya, all of a sudden I saw um, lots of my friends on social media who don't ever post anything about Africa talking about the slaves posted in Libya. And I said, well, if, I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but I'm saying, why are you choosing that? In your, the one thing you're going to post about Africa that I've ever seen you post is about these slaves in Libya when there's so much more that you've seen even I have posted that you don't even repost. Yeah, so for me, for me personally, you're never going to see... You can even, I mean, my social media handles are open. You will never see anything negative about anything to do with Africa or Africans or Nigerians. When they made that comment about shithole nations, the president made that comment, my immediate tweet 
was to, was to tweet out the statistics of how, how Nigerians are the most educated immigrant group in America, and they are more educated than Americans. That was the tweet that I put out. So it, if I was to say to you, I would, which is true, it's true. So if I would say to everybody here, um, and we all have different echo chambers. So when you live in the West, your echo chambers are your friends who are from the same countries of you as you, your black friends who are from the diaspora, and your white friends who are friends with you, and your non-white Asian, Asian Pacific Islander, etc. friends, your brown friends, and they still follow you. They still have conversations with you. And what you post, unfortunately, we're put in situations where we're told we speak for everybody. So just make sure what you say about us is positive because when they go home and turn on CNN International, they'll see enough negative things. They don't need to see it from you. And this one lady here, this is the final question. This is the final question. She can have my mic. We're not going to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this section. I want to ask from what he said, he has been speaking about branding. And we need, we need to brand Nigeria. We need to have a brand. And obviously, we do not have a brand. Now, how do we brand Nigeria? Now, because what I'm saying this is, obviously, my friend from Channels, is limited. What I've, dis uh, what I've noticed in this section is he's limited with what he says because he um, put it straight that the media is a business. So there are certain things that will not fly because it's a business. But we need to brand Nigeria. And, obvious, and he also mentioned leadership, which means it's a collective effort of not just the media, but everybody the government and so is it possible that maybe next social media week we have people in government sitting here why we when we talk about branding they are involved so that we don't just so, talk so about what is your question because you, question you sound is, like an extra panelist how do we brand nigeria after this okay. how do we collectively okay. Brand okay. name, because obviously that, that sounds like a masterclass for Charles to do. Yeah. And we don't have a time for a masterclass. But Charles, can you close the session with a response to that very good question? How do we brand Nigeria? And it's a big question to respond to in like 30 seconds. If you want to change the, the brand narrative for yourself, let me leave Nigeria. You need to first of all put together your brand DNA. The DNA is critical, so you understand who you are and you define your personal brand. So the same methodology you, put, you go through in defining the personal brand, you do the same in creating the DNA for a corporate or, of, or, or your state brand. Once you do that, you now achieve what I would call, um, you, you're now the brand um, equilibrium where you have defined the negatives, the positives, you have accepted all of that. Now, you're not made up of only one part. Of, one part. So for instance, you have your hand, your legs, they all form part of your body. You must have a platform that is single-minded and strategic that projects your unique selling point as you. You get it? So even if you like to play football or you like to watch TV, there must be something you love doing that, that separates you and differentiates you from any other brand. That is the process in creating a brand identity, but it starts through the definition of who you are from the inside to the outside. A brand is not a set of logos, it's not your identity, it's about the core from the inside to who you are on the outside. Wait for the masterclass. Thank you. And I'll add this, uh, as we live here, don't be bothered about anybody calling Africa a shit hole. Every country, have their own, every country has their own shit holes. So if they call you a shit hole, you remind them of their own shit holes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and thanks to my panelists, Charles and Keiichi, Chamberlain and Emojua. Thank you, everybody.